Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12 of the online course on photonic crystals, fundamentals and applications. Today's lecture will be discussing on the applications of 1D photonic crystals. So, here is the lecture outline, we will discuss about Bragg rating first, we will um, put forward the theory of Bragg reflection, then how do you make uh, Bragg rating using stack of partially reflected mirrors. Then we will also look for you know dielectric Bragg rating. Then we will discuss omnidirectional multilayer mirrors, periodic dielectric waveguides, point defects in those uh, dielectric waveguides and then we will look into the application of periodic dielectric waveguides as fiber Bragg rating. So, let us focus on the first application that is Bragg rating. So, Bragg rating is introduced as a set of uniformly spaced parallel partially reflective planar mirrors ok planar mirrors so this is how you can think of so these are basically partially reflective mirrors which are uniformly spaced and they are parallel to each other so there can be n number of identical mirrors so such a structure has angular and frequency selectivity and that is useful for many applications so, here we will generalize the definition of Bragg rating to include a set of n uniformly spaced identical multilayer segments. So, n can be any practical number, right? Integer. So, devices fabricated according to this prescription are something like distributed Bragg reflectors, which are DBRs in short form, or you can think of uh, fiber Bragg rating, that is FBG. So, these are very often used in resonators, lasers, you know and filters. So, let us go into a little bit of more details of how exactly Bragg reflection takes place. So, let us consider light reflected at an angle theta ok from this m parallel refracting planes which are basically separated by a distance of capital lambda. So, remember here the theta is basically measured from the you know plane of this uh, reflecting planes ok or from this reflecting planes you are measuring the uh, theta. So, let us assume that only a small fraction of the light that is reflected from each of this plane ok are actually coming back and you can think of the amplitudes of this m reflected waves to be approximately equal ok. So, the reflected waves will have a phase difference of phi which is basically you know uh, k 2 lambda ok sin theta. So, what is this theta? Theta is basically this angle ok and the phase difference is such that the intensity of the reflected light maximizes. So, you can think of you know sin theta b to be equal to lambda over 2 capital lambda. So, what is small lambda? So, small lambda is basically the wavelength of light, capital lambda is this particular um, period you can say or the thickness between the two uh, parallel refracting uh, planes and uh, sin theta b is basically your Bragg angle ok. So, here we understood that the maximum intensity of the reflected light can be achieved if uh, theta b satisfies this particular equation ok. So, such reflection are found in case when light encounters or light is reflected from a multilayer structure such as this and as we mentioned theta is basically defined with respect to this parallel planes. Now, the reflectance of Bragg rating is determined under two assumptions. First is that all these mirrors are basically weakly reflective mirrors ok. So, that the incident wave is not depleted as it is propagating. Means, if these are strongly reflecting mirrors then majority of the light will be reflected. So, there will be very little light which will be able to get into and hit the second mirror or the third mirror and so on. So, we assume that the mirrors are very weakly reflected. So, most of the light basically goes through penetrates inside and comes and hit the second one and so on and finally, you actually get a 
transmission also out of this entire you know brake grating. And second thing is we consider the secondary reflections which are basically the reflections of the reflected light okay those we consider to be negligible because if you consider those the calculations become much more messy. So, we are safe to um, assume that these secondary reflections are negligible because we consider the mirrors as very weakly reflective ones right. So, in this approximation you can actually calculate the reflectance of this entire structure to be R n ok. So, here n reminds you that you are talking about a n mirror grating ok. So, how it is related to a reflectance R of the single mirror you can actually look into this equation where R n equals sin square n phi over sin square phi times R. So, this is how you correlate the overall reflectance of this grating to the reflectance of a single mirror. So, here what is this phi? The phi is basically denoting the phase between the successive phasors whereas, you know here the phase is denoted by 2 phi because it represents a round trip. So, if you think of this factor sin square n phi over sin square phi ok, it represents the intensity of the sum of n phasors of unit amplitude and they have phase difference of 2 phi right. So, this function can have a peak value of n square ok when the break rating condition is satisfied that means, the round trip phase difference in each case will be integral multiple of 2 pi. So, you can write it as q 2 pi where q is nothing but 0, 1, 2 and dot 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 all the integers right. So, what we understood that at the peak uh, the value is very large it is equal to n square, but it drops away from this value sharply ok with a width that is inversely proportional to n ok. So, you can think of a very high q kind of a uh, reflection spectrum over here. So, in this simplified model the intensity of the total reflected wave is uh, typically you know go up to a factor of n square. Then the intensity of the wave that is reflected from a single mirror. So, this is what is the contribution from this factor. So, we understood that for a break grating comprising partially reflective mirrors which are separated from each other by a distance of capital lambda and if the round trip phase difference 2 phi is written as 2 k capital lambda cos theta considering that theta is now the angle of incidence not the angle from the surface of the mirrors ok. You can say that the maximum reflectance will occur when this round trip phase difference that is 2 k lambda cos theta is equal to q 2 pi or you can write 2 q pi ok. So, from here you can write cos theta is equal to q lambda over 2 capital lambda you can write this in terms of frequency you can write it as omega b over omega or you can write q nu b over nu. So, what is this? This is the Bragg frequency ok and this is the frequency that you are applying ok. So, what is the relation? As you can see that nu b the Bragg uh, linear frequency is basically c over 2 by capital lambda and the Bragg angular frequency will be 2 pi of this factor. So, it will be pi c by lambda you understand 2 2 cancels out ok. So, you will be left with pi c by lambda. So, that is omega p understood. So, only difference here is that the theta that we are considering is basically the incident angle ok. So, it is measured with respect to the normal ok. So, if we consider normal incidence the peak reflectance basically occurs at frequencies which are integral multiple of the Bragg frequency which is nu b. So, you can consider nu b or you will, it will be basically nu equals q nu b ok. So, all these frequencies so you can actually yeah that you can remove ok anyways. 
So, you read this as uh, nu equals nu, so nu equals q nu b. So, at the frequencies where the frequency is less than the Bragg frequency, it is clear that Bragg condition cannot be satisfied at any angle. And when you have frequencies, okay, which and when you have frequency, okay, which is in between um, Bragg frequency, so I think this will be nu, this will be nu b and this will be 2 nu b, okay. So, when you have frequency in between nu b and 2 nu b, that is where, you know, the Bragg condition can be satisfied at one angle and that angle can be found as theta equals cos inverse lambda over 2 capital lambda, okay. So, that boils down to cos inverse of nu b over nu. So, read this as, you know, nu b less than nu less than 2 nu b, okay. So, this is the, you know, simplified theory of Bragg rating. So, remember here that we have considered break rating consisting of n identical mirrors and the separation between the mirrors is given by capital lambda and if you try to plot the locus of the frequencies and angle at which the break rating is uh, or the break condition is satisfied, you can obtain a figure like this. So, what does it tell you? So, if you consider nu equals 1.5 nu b, okay. So, that is basically this point where nu by nu b will be 1.5. So, if you go ahead and you will find out that theta comes out to be 48.2 degrees, okay. So, this is the incident angle, okay, at which you will be able to get the break condition, right. Now, this corresponds to a break angle. So, for theta equals 48.2 degree, you can find theta b that is 90 minus theta which is basically 41.8 degrees when you are measuring from the plane of the grating. So, if you consider a break grating which has n equals 10 identical mirror and where the reflectance capital R or you can say uh, modulus of modulus square of the reflection coefficient okay, that is this one, that is equal to 0 0.5, okay. So, in such case, you can consider the dependence of phi on the inter mirror phase delay. So, phi actually tells you about the inter mirror phase delay, okay, that is n k naught and what is the separation between the two mirrors that is capital lambda. What is n? n is basically the refractive index of this medium, right? And k naught is the vacuum wave number. Fine. So, if you think of this, so within the shaded regions, you can see that uh, phi, the phase is basically complex and its imaginary part that is phi i is represented by dust curves, right? And if you plot the reflectance capital R as a function of frequency, okay. So, the frequency is basically here in terms of the break frequency nu b. So, you are taking in terms of say 0 nu b, 2 nu b. So, at every um, integral multiple of uh, nu b, the break frequency, you will see there is reflection. So, there is a stop band. Okay. So, the first one is here and then you have uh, at nu b, at 2 nu b, 3 nu b and so on. Okay. So, what happens at the stop bands, you can see that the reflectance is almost unity. So, whatever is getting incident, it is basically getting reflected. So, now you can think of a dielectric break rating where you choose your, um, you know, grating um, materials according to your need. So, let us calculate the power reflectance, okay, which is capital R as a function of the frequency for a dielectric break rating. So, here let us consider n equals 10. So, you have got 10 segments and each of this segment is basically uh, comprising of two layers. So, 
one material is having refractive index of n1 another one is got n2 and n1 we consider say 1.5 and n2 is 3.5 and we have considered the thickness d1 and d2 to be equal in this case okay and another thing is you consider the grating to be placed in a medium that matches with the refractive index of n1 so the outside media of this grating is also having refractive index of n1 so when you do that okay the reflectance is approximately unity within the stop bands which are centered at nu b and this nu b is nothing but c by 2 capital lambda where you have to consider c as you know c naught over n bar so what is c naught c naught is basically the speed of light in vacuum okay and n bar is here the mean refractive index because the refractive index is changing over this uh, period so you have to consider the mean refractive index right so you can see that the stop bands behave like this for this kind of uh, break grating so now let us uh, move on to the next subtopic which is omnidirectional multilayer mirrors so when you think of omnidirectional multilayer mirrors we are basically considering all the directions right so we have to consider off axis propagation so if you remember our discussion about uh, this 1d photonic crystal we were mainly focusing on the wave factor that lies along z axis but you know that has always uh, given us the k parallel that is the wave vector along the plane to be zero right because we only consider the modes to be propagating along the z direction but now let us consider the off axis modes as well so in this particular figure you can see that there are some off axis modes okay shown for wave vector k equals k y y cap okay so this is for the k z okay case but these are the these are the band structure which corresponds to um, off axis propagation so the photonic band structure here which is plotted is basically for you know a multilayer film which has got a lattice constant of a and uh, it has got alternating layers of different widths so what has been considered epsilon equals 13 as one layer and the thickness for that layer is 0.2 a okay and the width of the other layer that is epsilon equals 1 that is air is considered to be 0. 8a so with that that particular band diagram okay is obtained now here there are two interesting features so one you called as on axis bands so these ones okay so they are represented as 0 0 kz okay that is on the left side and you also have off axis band structure that is this one which can be re represented as 0 ky 0 right which is displayed on the right so here you see that the on axis the bands typically overlap so they are degenerate however when you go to um, ky that is the off axis case the bands basically split into two distinct polarization so the blue one tells you about tm which is x polarized and the red one tells you about t which is yz polarized okay fine so when I say YZ polarized, it means the polarization lies in YZ plane, right? So the important difference between this on axis and off axis propagation is that there is no band gap in the case of off axis propagation that is possible for all the values of uh, KY, okay? So this is always the case for a multilayer film because the off axis uh, contains no periodic dielectric region to coherently scatter light and which can split open a gap so you do not get a band gap which is so here you can see there is a band gap but here but here it actually merges okay so that is between n equals 1 and 2 okay 
here also you can see they are basically getting much so there is no band gap that is wide open for entire value of k y okay so another important difference as we already discussed between on axis and off axis case is the degeneracy of the bands because here you can see the red and the blue are kind of overlapping right so the electric field in the case of on axis are oriented at x y plane okay and we might choose the two basic polarizations as x and y directions now since um, those two modes differ only by a rotational symmetry which the crystal already uh, proposes possesses so they are degenerate and rightly so you can see here that all these uh, x and y polarized x polarized and yz polarized are basically overlapping now whenever a mode is propagating along any arbitrary direction of k this symmetry is broken and the degeneracy is lifted and that is why you can actually see that all the bands are different in case of this ky okay off axis propagation there are other symmetries for example notice that the system is invariant under reflection through yz plane so whenever we are discussing about the system i hope all of you understand that this is the system we are discussing about right so they are saying that across yz plane it has got a reflection symmetry which is true okay and the system is basically invariant under reflection through yz plane yes because in yz it is just you know along that plane this so we can see that the system is invariant under reflection through the yz plane so for the special case of propagation um, down the dielectric sheets in the y direction the possible polarizations are in the x direction that is you can call them as tm polarization or it is along the yz plane you can take it as t polarization but there is no rotational symmetry relationship between these two bands okay and uh, they will generally have different frequencies as displayed in the figure so this is what you can see here so we have mentioned this again uh, previously that for the case of off axis polarization a multi layer film does not have a complete uh, band gap okay once one allows for a component of the wave vector that is parallel to the layers so another way to state that is that for every choice of omega there exist extended modes okay in this in the film for some wave vector k parallel kz right there is no band gap means for every frequency there is some kind of you know mode possible okay and here the wave vectors will be k parallel kz so given this fact it may seem paradoxical that a properly designed multi layer structure can still reflect light that are incident from any angle with any polarization if the frequency uh, lies within a certain specified range so this kind of uh, device is called an omnidirectional mirror and it relies basically on two physical properties the first one is that the k vector is conserved at any interface parallel to the layers if the light source is far away okay that it does not interrupt with the uh, translational symmetry of the structure in that direction second is light that is incident from air must have omega greater than ck okay that means corresponding to freely propagating modes which are above the light line so omega equals ck is basically the light line so you consider you know in this case that light should the which are incident from the air should have you know frequency more than ck so the modes that are below the light line will not be allowed 
So, they are basically the evanescent modes that cannot reach the mirror from a far away source. Okay? And because of these two properties, so there are two uh, properties. So, one is that the light source is far away and the second thing is the light which is incident from air must have omega greater than c k. Okay? So, with these two, you can actually make the device work like a omnidirectional mirror okay? and because of these two properties, the modes of the crystal harbors below the light line are irrelevant for the purpose of reflection. So, to investigate this omnidirectional reflection, let us plot this omega versus k y. So, again we plot in terms of normalized frequency and normalized wave vector. So, here you can see the modes okay, which are the shaded regions for the off axis propagation and the propagation vectors are 0, k z and k y and what we have considered here, we have considered a quarter wave stack with permittivity 13 and 2. Okay? So, we have discussed about quarter wave stack where, where the thickness of uh, each layer is basically quarter wave length. Ah. So, they are not identical right? because the permittivity is different for the two layers. Now, the if you consider y z plane as a plane of incidence okay, with y direction which is parallel to the layers and z direction is basically perpendicular to the layers. right? So, you always keep this in mind this particular schematic with this coordinate system. Okay? Now, however, we must consider that both of the possible polarization states that is T m when the electric field is perpendicular to the plane of uh, incidence okay, and T in which the electric field is within the plane of incidence. Okay. So, you can actually call what is the plane of incidence? You can call, consider Y z plane as your plane of incidence. So, when you have you know the field which is electric field in the plane of incidence, you can call it also as p polarized light. So, you can say T modes are basically p polarized and when it uh, strikes out of the plane of incidence, you can call it as s polarized light okay? and that is why the T m modes can be called as s polarized light. Okay? Now, here the example structure that you see okay, has got lot of interesting points. Okay? Now, what are these different lines. So, you can see the green shaded regions correspond to the p polarized ones and the blue shaded regions are basically corresponding to the s polarized light. right? And then there is a range of frequency here within which all of the modes of the multi layer are basically below the light line. Okay? Now, where is the light line? this is the light line. Okay? So, you can see a slope here. Okay? So, in this particular frequency range which is marked as uh, yellow, okay, you can see that the bands uh, or you can see that all the modes of the multilayer film lies below the light line. So, it means that within this range, any uh, incident plane wave cannot couple to the extended states of the layers. Okay? That means, their field will decay exponentially within the quarter wave stick. Okay? And the transmission through such a mirror will drop uh, exponentially with the number of layers. So, the light will be perfectly reflected. Okay? if you consider that the material absorption is negligible. Okay? So, one more time let us uh, clarify this particular band diagram which is very, very important for omnidirectional um, scattering. So, here you can see couple of interesting points that is B which is basically a dashed white line which corresponds to the Brewster's angle. Okay? So, this gives uh, rise to the crossing at B okay? 
and as I mentioned this straight line the red straight line that you see here is basically the light line which is omega c k y ok above which the extended modes exist in air ok. So, these are air bands ok. Now, if you consider the yellow shaded region ok. So, in this region you see the first frequency range of omnidirectional reflection. So, L stands for the lower edge ok and U stands for the upper edge right and that is how you actually see this particular band. So, this is the case where no band or mode is allowed. So, that will be reflected ok. So, once again the blue region indicates uh, T or P polarized and the sorry the green one the left side of the green indicates the modes with uh, fields polarized in the y z incidence plane that means we are referring to T or P polarization modes and on the right side you have blue bands which corresponds to electric field polarized in the x direction that means we are talking about T m or s polarized. Lines. So, what we understood that omnidirectional reflection is not a general property of 1D photonic crystal. So, there are basically two necessary condition. First, the dielectric constant contrast between the two mirror materials must be sufficiently large. So, that the point leveled u that is upper is lying above the point which is marked as l that is lower. Now, if the band gap is too narrow ok, we will hit the top u of k y equals 0 before the bottom of the gap ok, ok, where the gap has exited from the light cone that is exactly at this point L. So, it should not happen that this point is coming below this L point ok and that is why the dielectric con contrast between the two materials should be large enough. Second, the smaller dielectric constant that is uh, epsilon 1 must be larger than the dielectric constant of the ambient medium by a critical amount ok. So, it should not be air that should be a you know uh, material which has got slightly larger refractive index or dielectric constant than air and that is also required to satisfy this condition ok. So, this critical contrast with the ambient medium is reached when the P or T modes are pulled down in frequency far enough that this B point in the figure where basically the first band and the second band intersect ok that does not fall above the light line ok. So, you have to make sure that this point falls below the light line. So, the light line is this one. So, for that you need to have a critical contrast of this lower mid lower dielectric with the ambient medium. So, that is why you know we have chosen epsilon 1 equals 2 rather than taking that of air in this particular example. Now, the point B falls on a line that corresponds to the Brewster angle ok. So, what happens you know at Brewster angle for P polarization light there will be no reflection ok at that epsilon 1 epsilon 2 interface and the lack of reflection is what permits the bands to intersect. So, combining these two criteria ok you can think of the size of the omnidirectional gap as a function of the ratio of square root of epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 and epsilon 1 over the ambient ok for the case of quarter wave stack. So, this is the 
interesting plot that tells you about this contrast of the two material and contrast of the lower dielectric material with ambient okay and this is the you know gap mid gap ratio okay so you can see that you know at 70% 60% and so on so you can actually have very large gap mid gap ratio okay now here let us consider one particular system like silicon silica in air so epsilon 2 epsilon 1 and this is epsilon a okay so here also you can see that we are talking about quarter wavelength stack so epsilon 2 thickness is much smaller as compared to epsilon 1 right so the figure here also shows that we are talking about you know light incident from an ambient medium which has got a uh, dielectric constant of epsilon a now our choice of material is such that epsilon 2 is larger than epsilon 1 and epsilon 1 is larger than epsilon a right so it does not matter which material forms the edge of the mirror so it can be epsilon 1 in the front meeting the epsilon a or other ways okay that does not actually make a difference so here you see you have uh, for this ranges you actually get this om omnidirectional uh, gap okay so if you choose this ratio to be say 3.5 okay and this ratio also to be 3.5 you can actually go up to very very wide band gap of something like more than 70 percent okay so if you choose common material like silicon silica in air okay that falls typically in this region that is you can have a you know gap mid gap ratio within say 20 and 30 percent okay so strictly speaking a quarter wave stack does not maximize the size of the omnidirectional gap but in practice it nearly does so so people simply go with quarter wave uh, stack okay and instead of this quarter wave stack if you would have done some optimization and uh, used those optimized stacks you would have seen that the contours are displaced by less than 2% okay along either axis so that's kind of you know not a very very productive exercise to do for further optimization of this uh, um, stack layer you know thicknesses over the easier one which is the quarter wave stack okay because only improvement you can get is typically 2% okay so a suitably designed multi-layer film can therefore function as a omnidirectional mirror but there are some things it cannot do its reflective properties depends on the translational symmetry of the interface and uh, consequently it cannot confine a mode in three dimension in addition if the interface is not flat or if there is an object or a light source which is close to the surface then k is not conserved okay in that case light will generally couple to the extended modes propagating in the mirror and they will be translated so you will not get a omnidirectional mirror okay so this is an interesting exception however if the mirror is curved around a hollow sphere or cylinder then the continuous rotational symmetry can substitute for this translational symmetry and light can be then localized within the core so as with the planar mirror the leakage rate from the core to the exterior decreases exponentially with uh, the number of layers here also you can see the same thing so you can actually make this kind of uh, grating in a cylindrical case you can call it brack fiber and you can also have a core and this kind of you know silica silicon alternating layer cladding um, 
around a sphere and the spherical case is typically dubbed as Bragg onion. Okay? So, here one did not require omnidirectional mirrors okay, to obtain localized modes because the modes rotational symmetry would impose the restriction on the angles that it can escape into a larger radii. So, the localization of modes will be possible. So, with that we move on to our next topic that is periodic dielectric waveguides. So, periodic dielectric waveguides which have only one dimensionally you know periodic pattern or grading along the direction of propagation, but the difference is that it has got finite thickness and finite width. So, there are different types of structure which are possible. One can be this you know in a slab thin slab you can have periodic 1D array of holes. You can think of array of dielectric cylinders or you can have this kind of a structure. So, it will turn out that regardless of the geometry all these uh, structures will exhibit a common phenomena. They will form a typical photonic band gap along their periodic function along their periodic dimension and they can confine light in the other two directions by using the principle of index guiding. Okay? Because these will be like high index and outside there will be lower index material the surrounding. So, in one direction they will confine light using the photonic band gap in the other directions they will be using the concept of index guiding. Okay? So, this is what we understood. Now, let us look into this particular dielectric waveguide and another waveguide which is basically a periodic you know 1D periodic structure of uh, squares. So, one dimensional periodic pattern that will combine index wave guiding in one dimension and photonic band gap in the other dimension. So, we are not thinking about the z direction here, we are just talking about a two dimensional uh, figure. Okay? So, in this dielectric wave guide we are considering the material permittivity to be uh, 12 and say it has got a width of 0 0.4 a and a is basically the periodicity. Okay? So, what do you have seen? So, 0.4 a, 0.4 a. So, we have got a square, dielectric square and this is the direction of the propagation okay? and this is when you compare it with a you know uniform dielectric waveguide. So, what are the differences of these two structures in terms of their band gap? So, you can see the band diagrams of the waveguides. So, we have considered only for T m waves that is for k z equals 0. Okay? So, in plane light. So, left one shows for uniform waveguide whereas, the right one shows for periodic waveguide okay? and the size of the bent diagram is typically twice the irreducible uh, brilliant zone. So, typically you, we take from minus uh, you can keep the center across 0 and minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 or you can just put it you know 0 to 1. So, again this is a normalized frequency and these are normalized wave vector. Okay? So, what you see this blue shaded so this is basically the light line. Okay? So, this is where you know you have modes propagating in air. Okay? So, these are the blue shaded region in the light cone. So, that represents states or modes which are propagating in air. Okay? And then what do you have? You have discrete bands okay, which are leveled as even and odd according to y equals 0 mirror symmetry plane. So, if you see here y equals 0 will go through the center of this particular waveguide. Okay? Same here also. So, depending on whether the electric field profile is symmetrical across this plane, 
we can call it as even or odd okay so what you see here you have even band one even odd band one like that okay but for the periodic structure you have even band one and then here you have even band two so for even band one and two you have this much of band gap okay so the waveguide is symmetric under reflections through y equals zero because y equals zero basically bisects it okay so as i understood um, that all the guided modes can be uh, classified as even or odd with respect to their mirror reflection okay from this particular plane so we see that there is one even band and one odd band okay and the even band is basically the fundamental board because it has got lower frequency okay as compared to the odd bands now if you look into the patterns so this is what your uh, even band means so if you take the plane y equals zero you'll see it is symmetrical on up and bottom side okay so that way you can think of even band one this is even band two okay so here the modes or high low are splitting at the center of the square so this is a higher frequency mode and this is odd band one so it is very similar to this just that you know upper side and the lower side these two are opposite to each other okay so that is how you can think of the electric field pattern so we are basically plotting z pattern okay at um, k equals pi by a which is at the um, edge of the brilliant zone right now if you think of periodic dielectric waveguide which is uh, having a finite thickness okay that becomes a three dimensional dielectric strip so something like this suspended in air so you have this holes okay so the periodicity is considered to be a okay so these are cylindrical air holes okay and you can plot it plot the band diagram only within the uh, irreducible brilliant zone so here also you can see that you have this odd mode 1 and 2 giving you a band gap and so more so on okay so this is how the mode looks like so this is the fundamental mode this is the higher order mode so this is 1 and 2 okay so the discrete guided modes are leveled according to their symmetry as described okay and uh, we have considered the fundamental e and m band gaps that is the electric and the magnetic band gaps um, shaded in red and blue okay so the light cone is shown here okay and here you can see uh, this is one band gap and this is another band gap So now let's focus on the point defects in this periodic dielectric waveguides. So what happens when you consider a point defect? So you are basically thinking of a localized resonant mode in a cavity that is formed by this defect in the periodic waveguide and that is suspended in air. So if you think of this geometry again, let's go back here. So when you take the cross section or electric field pattern along z equals 0 plane that is along the xy plane you will see like this right and when you take from y equals 0 that is from the side you see this is how it looks like so whenever there is a you know say how do you create a defect here say one pair of hole the spacing between them you change from a to 1.4 a and that will become a that particular one will become a defect because normally otherwise that uh, periodicity is a so you have changed one and made it uh, 1.4 a right so what you will see you will see strong localization and exponentially decaying fields in the waveguide as you can see from this uh, cross section okay and if you also see this particular you know uh, saturated color scale you can see that the from the defect you know the field only uh, decays inversely with the distance 
and um, it will slowly show some radiative leakage okay and we are using you know saturated color scales to show this uh, very small field values but this is how the field will uh, actually leak out so that mode will not propagate right so we'll see an application of this kind of periodic dielectric waveguide as fiber break grating so what is fiber break grating so you can take a fiber and then modulate the index of the fiber core by exposing it to a pattern of uv light exposure and you can create this high low high low kind of variation in the refractive index you can maintain the period to be capital lambda g so that is how you are able to create a periodic dielectric waveguide in the core of a optical fiber and that is very useful because you can take this standard glass fiber which is anyways guiding light by index guiding and what you are doing you are basically including a weak periodic variation of the refractive index along the fiber core and from break grating we understand that whichever wavelength will satisfy the condition of break reflection will be basically reflected from this grating and remaining will be transferred so you can think of a input signal which has got a wide frequency band okay you can see only one particular band say the green yellow green wavelength or say the green wavelength is getting reflected so the transmitted light will look like this so this basically gives you a kind of notch uh, or a band stop kind of a response okay so these are the different applications of um, periodic dielectric waveguide as fiber break grating. So with that we conclude this lecture and um, in the next lecture we will discuss about the fundamentals of 2D photonic crystals. If you have got any query regarding this lecture you can write an email to me at this particular email address mentioning MOOC and uh, photonic crystal in the subject line. Thank you. Mm -hmm.